everybody. I've been given like 10 minutes, so we've got to get started. If it goes more than 10 minutes, I'll be in trouble because I'll take his precious time. So this is our last, Rob's and my last Sunday here. I cannot believe it. This has all come about way too fast. It's come like left field for us to be going and it's just been too fast, really. I haven't got my head around it. People have been saying, does it feel a bit surreal, Deb? Well, no, it doesn't feel surreal. It just feels like it's not happening. (laughs) Truly, I really expect to be here next Sunday. I truly, in my heart, I really do think that. So I don't know what's going to happen. You better pray for me because one day I'm going to be face planted into the wall when I go, what am I doing up here and why aren't I home? On the way here this morning, I just said to Rob, even though I still think we'll be here, I said, gee, a lot's happened. We drove out of Queensland. We're actually going back to Queensland. We drove out of Queensland with three little kids in the back seat of our station wagon. Joel was five, Leah was nearly four and Daniel was one. Can I just say to all you people who have prayed for Daniel, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was with him last night and he said, actually, look, I'll tell you, I had a vision and I saw like those neuropath things in his brain because I asked for a vision. God, show me how to pray. And I've been up in the middle of the night, most nights praying for him. And I saw like tunnels. Narelle runs a wonderful course in this church. I recommend everybody do it. There you go, Narelle, you'll be busy. And I just saw that maybe some of those pathways had collapsed, had been like blocked. So I just asked God, would you heal them? Would you open them up? Would they flourish? And I was with him last night there to help him vacuum and used our vacuum cleaner before we leave. And and he said, Mum, he said, "I, I have to be really honest and tell you, that I just feel so different. And I said, what, from before things went bad? He said, no, in my life, forever, I feel so different. So I'm just saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you for our prodigals coming home. (laughs) But anyway, this morning we were driving here and we were just talking about, gee, when, when we left... Queensland, we had three little kids in the back seat, a six by four trailer full of trikes and bikes and not much else. That's all we came with. Now we've got two big pods that we're packing and it's very crazy. But so much has happened. We came, we left, Rob left a big promotion, big pay rise. Life was looking very successful, but we'd got saved three years before and our families down in South Australia weren't saved. I've, I've got a lot of family in Queensland, which I'm going back to, but a lot here, and Rob's were all here. And they weren't saved. So we laid it all down. And it's not, I'm not being noble or anything like that. It's just saying that's what we did. We laid it all down. And to see our families get saved, that was the only reason. Came to no job, no house, just our six by four trailer with three kids. And this is what God has done. So we got to Queen. Uh, we got to. We got a house in Coromandel Valley. We'd been saved in a little church with every denomination in it, about thirty people, and we thought that was the church we'd find in Adelaide. Every denomination in it, loving every denomination, and somehow we ended up with this house church. You know, we were setting up house, and every time I'd buy a coffee mug or a rake. Or a cushion cover. I just would hear this verse. It's Isaiah 66 verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house you'll build for me? Every time I buy anything, a pillowcase, where is the house you'll build for me? Where, is my, where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. Drove me mad, that verse. I felt guilty every time I bought something. 
So I thought, well, God, we'll just love people. We'll just start loving people. And we did. There was a mum at school whose half, her kitchen had half burnt down. Did we really love that lady? No. Did I really care that her kitchen had half burnt down? She was a single mum with two kids. No. This is a terrible confession to say, isn't it? But I really did love the Lord. And so I asked him, God, what do you want me to do about that kitchen? Everything has always been about him. And that's probably why Gary and Sarah are coming now to grow this place full of people. Because every time I read the Holy Scriptures, it's not the Holy, me, myself and I. Every time it's about him. And so the scripture in Matthew 6.33 that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to him. That doesn't mean when you gave your heart to him five or ten or fifteen years ago. Oh yes, I've become a Christian. Yes. And so I'm seeking the Lord then. That verse is for every moment of every day. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. So I could prattle on here, I suppose, and I'm not allowed to. Rob's going to preach. I've never been a preacher. He said, oh, don't tell too many stories, Debbie. I said, oh, people love stories, Rob. Yes, yeah. yeah, did you hear that? He heard clapping. So some people have said to me, look at the church you're leaving behind. Yeah, but it was never for us or or even you, really. This was built for Jesus. It's all about him. Every time we open our mouth, every time we do something, every time we started a life group, it was never about for the people. People thought it was for them. Somehow we made them think that. (laughs) It's always for Jesus that this place would be buzzing for him. It's the Holy Scriptures. Every verse in the Bible is about Jesus. It's about the Lord. But, you know, we read it like, oh, seek ye first, his, oh, but, and then all these things will be added to me. I'll have nice clothes, and I'll have a nice house, and I'll have this, 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 this. It's all about him. It was lovely seeing you nearly cry today, Lockie. I thought, yes, you get him, God, you get him. So I feel like we're going from the pan into the fire. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, even half the churches don't like ACL, let alone the world. So we've got about, what's that mean? 5% of someone might like us in the whole world. I don't know. But you know what? I don't care because it's all about him. I'm just so thankful for what Jesus has done in my life. You know, if there's coffee spilled out in the, in the cafe... We can go, oh, oh, I don't have to clean that up, do I? Oh, don't they have a cleaner? I know the cleaner's coming today. Or it's about his house still. We don't ask, should I clean that up? His house is dirty. I'll, I'll get the mop. Or anything with anybody that you know. If, even if you don't like them, that's okay. Even if they're a Christian and you don't like them, that's okay. What would Jesus want you to do for them? So I just pray that this place is going to prosper. It's going to be overflowing with four services on Saturday and Sunday and Friday night and Thursday night. And I just pray for like, not a Toronto blessing, but a Southland blessing here that's going to reach out far and wide, even across the world. Do you know how Southland got its name? We became a vineyard and so we put our name forward to America. We'll be called Adelaide Vineyard. No, 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 that's too controlling of the city. Pick another name. We're dealing with Americans. They don't really know much about Australia. Well, how about Southland? You know, the great Southland, all of Australia. No, we know you, that's a good name. That's smaller. (laughs) We just laugh. (laughs) So I better hand over the mic now. Come on, Rob. But the legacy we want to leave here in this place, and I think it's why a lot of people don't stay, it's not about me, myself and I. This place and every group that has started, even spot fires, you know, 
It's not about, oh, Gary, you can, Sarah, you can fix this up next week. You can say Debbie taught heresy on Sunday. <laughs> it's not about you feeling comfortable and feeling proud that you got up, uh, that you came on Thursday night, gave that up. It's about him. It's about meeting together for him. Oh, and here's a little quick thing about life groups. We get some very talkative people in life groups and I have been one of them and I've had to learn. And if, so you can think of it this way. If there's an hour to talk and there's ten people in the group, you get six minutes only. You don't get 30 minutes to talk because actually I've had to learn this. I'm talking to myself here. Us talkative ones can actually kill the group and we actually think that, oh, everybody wants to hear what we've got to say. Why am I saying this? This is, this is really easy for you life group leaders. I've just said it for you. Work out how many people are in the group and divide it and that's what you get. So goodbye, my friends. You have been become my friends and family. Some of you I'm very close to. Don't know why that is. Some of you I'm getting to know. I really don't want to let go of this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> just please please remember it's all about jesus you come to worship him on sunday you don't come for your click you come to worship jesus and we're so thankful for what he's done for all of us feel a bit like, is that working? Yep. I actually feel a bit like John Farnham. I reckon we've had about six farewells in the last three months. And I'm not going to sing either. But seriously, the last six months has just been an absolutely incredible journey and we haven't even started yet. We haven't even hit the road. So Wednesday morning, Deb and I will be up at about 5.30 in the morning uh, we'll be in our car that'll be loaded up with luggage and other things you don't need to know about. And we'll be heading to Queensland. And we'll arrive on Thursday evening. Um, and then next Monday morning I start work and I think I've got about three scheduled meetings through the week around the place on topics ranging from Human Rights Commission to COVID lockdowns to whatever else issues. Uh, Zoe's Law, all sorts of things that are popping up and it's, it's quite daunting. So you'll need to pray for us because uh, it's going to be a little bit different. But what I, wanted to, uh, what I wanted to speak to this morning is something that's very historic for us as a church. And I want to talk about what it means to be a prophetic church. In many respects, I want to encourage you and I want to encourage you particularly in the journey ahead because this is going to become a greater challenge as we move ahead. A prophetic church is a church that proclaims the truth and it proclaims the truth to every realm of humanity, every part of society. Um, it, that includes the sacred, in other words, church. It also includes the secular, in other words, when you go to work, when you stand on a street corner, when you go to the club, when you hang out with friends. Even more than that, a prophetic church speaks that which God has instructed her to speak. And I say her because that's the correct gender for the church. Without embellishment and without trying to make the message more palatable to those who are receiving it. That's a really important part of it. And once we start messing with that last few words, the church ceases to be prophetic. It starts to be what we think it should be. The 21st century church, I think, is in great and grave danger of modifying the message to make it more palatable. Because that's what the world wants and that's what we've provided. Now, we've been through two or three years of very interesting times where in many respects the church has had a chance to speak prophetically 
and we've gone missing. We've basically melded into the world. Now, for better or for worse, there could be good reasons for that, and I'm sure it can be rationalised. But guys, we've got to be careful that the message we bring is unadulterated. It's either directly from Scripture, and you guys know that Scripture has always been our foundation. This church was built on a Bible, by the way, and it's under, I think, the second lift, the one on the left. If you go right down into the foundations, there's a big old black leather-bound Bible in that foundation. And that's not just a, a, a symbolic thing. It also speaks of our heart to speak the truth. And so the church is in danger. We're, in a, we're at a crossroad. And when I say that, I'm, t I'm speaking about collectively the church. And may, though it may seem prudent to reinterpret what to many is antiquated scripture and redundant prophetic language, we've got to resist doing that. We mustn't do that. Yes, there is a, a case for helping people understand taking them through the historical context, exegeting scripture accurately. We should always do that. But we've got to be careful not to reinterpret it. You see, redemptive history tends to repeat itself. And what we see throughout scripture and even post-scripture <clears throat> is that we see shadows and types of things to come. And so as a prophetic church, we are a shadow of what is coming. We're meant to represent heaven. I want to this morning uh, use an example through the prophet Elijah. I think this guy was a person who completely epitomised God's intention for prophetic ministry. I actually think he's a type for the church. And I think if we look at his ministry, we should see a reflection of who we really are. If we don't see that reflection clearly, then perhaps there's something wrong. So the New Testament verifies this. If we look at Matthew 17 and think about the, the Mount of Transfigurations, just picture that situation. What we see there is Jesus standing with Moses and Elijah. He's standing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember Peter, James, John watching on, the inner circle checking them out. So what you see on the Mount of Transfiguration is the law and the prophets and the New Testament all together. Moses, Elijah and Jesus. And so it's important that we remember that those three aspects are actually eternally of great use. They never passed away. The prophetic message began in Genesis and it ends in Revelation. And then we get to live it out. Elijah's battle, as documented throughout 1 Kings with Ahab and Jezebel, is a battle that has recurred throughout redemptive history. And the book of Revelation tells us that it will keep going right till the very end. You see, Elijah was sent by God to confront the most evil regime in history. Now, I believe that that is a type for where the church is at today. If you look at the ministry of Elijah, it didn't end in the Old Testament. It continues right through to the book of Revelation. These three, Elijah, Ahab and Jezebel, are actually types of things that were yet to come, that we're now being confronted with. Ahab was the representative of government. Jezebel was obviously the representative of the evil influence of the world. And then you've got Elijah, who is the prophetic voice of the church, speaking to those things, sometimes with fear and trepidation, but never backing off. The church of Thyatira in Revelation 2 had surrendered its prophetic authority and it had been seduced by a spirit of Jezebel. This is how we know that this is an eternal thing. It goes right through to the end. In Revelation 2, verse 18, it says this. And you might note this morning, there's no text on the wall. My PC's packed. It's in the second pod. So I didn't get too carried away with trying to prepare a, um, a PowerPoint. And secondly, you should bring your Bible with you to church every single week. So if you have your Bible, open it up. If you don't, open your iPhone or whatever it is that the Bible's on. 
And in Revelation 2, verse 18, it says, To the church, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose light eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. This is the Lord. Unless they repent of her ways. Isn't that interesting? Unless they repent of her ways. Verse 23, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. You see, in essence, Jezebel prophesied out of a seductive and worldly spirit because that's what she was. That's what she is. That's what she represents. Over the years, Deb and I have pushed back against the temptation to transform the Sunday service at Southland into a seeker-sensitive service. If you say that really quickly, you'll be speaking in tongues. Now, I'm really proud of Gary and Sarah because they have the same heart of as us. Southland will never be a church that exists for seekers. It's like what Deb said this morning. We didn't start this church for people. We understand that that's a symptom of the church. But ultimately, we started this church because we felt that God needed to be worshipped in this city. And that's not to say that other churches aren't worshipping God. But Southland exists to worship. We exist to be a prophetic voice to the world and we exist to build a foundation on the, on the word of God. So over the years, we've avoided a seeker-sensitive ministry model because that contains the elements of seduction that ultimately requires both the message that's scriptural and the prophetic uh, truths to become palatable to seekers and unbelievers. Now, there are churches that have exploited that, that idea very successfully and they become large mega churches. Maybe Southland will never be a mega church, and I don't purpose for that to be a, a curse. I don't think it is. I think it's just an observation. If we are a mega church, it won't be because we've compromised. Because Gary and Sarah are committed to the truth, they're committed to preaching scripture. Last week, I think Gary booted the football completely out of the park with his teaching because he nailed it in scripture and that's what we do so Jezebel's ministry is still immersed in the church and in the world and she brings with her a deep hatred for the prophetic ministry she will do everything she can to water that down and so the prophetic church is an exercise in obedience God's calling us to obedience God's calling the whole church to obedience, but we have responsible for this quarter of the church. In 1 Kings 17 and verse 1, Elijah spoke to King Ahab and told him that there would be no rain on the land for years. Then he turned and ran because he knew that the way Ahab and Jezebel operated was not going to be conducive to life. In 1 Kings 17 verse 1, it says, As the Lord... The God of Israel lives, whom I serve. So he was establishing who he is and where he stands. There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. No wonder he took off. These guys were raving lunatics. And they absolutely detested the prophetic. The text doesn't record what Ahab's response was, but Elijah didn't hang around to find out. He did not complete the fifth step of the healing prayer model. There was no post-prayer counsel. He just turned around and ran. 
And he followed instead the Lord's instruction and sought to survive the drought that was to come. And so he went down to the creek and the ravens looked after him and fed him and so forth. You know the story. And if you don't, go to 1 Kings 17 and read it for yourself. Eventually, Elijah received another word for Ahab. And again, obedience was at the root of the prophetic message. I want you to hear that this morning. Obedience is at the root of the, of the prophetic message. We deliver what we have. We give what we've got. We don't water it down. We don't mess it around with it. We just say, this is what the Lord says. And so in 1 Kings 18, from verse 1, it says, After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. But Ahab had summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord, while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets. Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land where they, they were to cover, cover, Ahab going one direction, Obadiah in another. When we read scripture, guys, we've got to read it for everything it's got, not just gloss over it. You can do that. And it's good because it'll go into your spirit. And if you do it again and again, it'll, it'll start to soak in. But we have a responsibility also to read and understand Scripture. And so what I read and understand in that passage is that the world has no fear of God. Remember Ahab and Jezebel, representatives of government and the world? The world doesn't fear God. In fact, it denies him, and even worse, it mocks him. We're seeing that work out. We see it in the press. We see it in our discussions with people. We see it in the way uh, the world explains everything that happens. There's no fear of God. Ahab didn't fear God either. And so when drought came on the land, as the prophet said it would, Ahab snapped into action. It says he started searching out grass around the dry creeks. So he had a contingency, he had a plan. His idea was, we can do this without God. Remember, Ahab wasn't the kind of guy that was ignorant. He came from Israel. So there was a long line of knowledge of God's works. He wasn't doing this ignorantly. What he was doing is turning his back on God and saying, it's okay, we can, we can fix this. We've got this. You throw whatever you like at us, even if this has come from the Lord, we can fix it. And so he snapped into action. He certainly didn't call the nation to prayer or repentance as previous kings had. Instead, he threw the national budget at saving livestock and trying to counter what God had said would happen prophetically. Does any of that sound familiar? Ahab didn't fear the Lord. Even though Elijah said there would be no rain, he intentionally stood against God. Now, guys, I believe that we are, and I believe we're in a place in history where that's happening again, where the world is not ignorant of God, but we are standing in opposition and we're choosing to make a way for ourselves. In 1 Kings 18, from verse 7, what we see here is that the law hates prophets and the prophetic. You might think, well, that's, that's a little bit cherry-picking. But here it is. It says this, As Obadiah was walking home, Elijah met him, and Obadiah recognised him, bowed down to the ground, and said, Is it really you, my lord Elijah? Yes, he replied, go tell your master, Elijah is here. What have I done wrong? Asked Obadiah. There's the first hint. The law always says, what have I done wrong? 
How have I missed it? What have I not done? What have I done badly? What have I done wrong? Asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death. As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed that you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave. If I go tell Ahab, he doesn't, he doesn't find you. He will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. And there's the second hint. Again, Obadiah is saying, I've done everything right. Not only have I done nothing wrong, but I've done everything right. I've worshipped the Lord since my youth. I've done it consistently. I've come to church every week. I was baptised. I was confirmed. I showed up to the prayer meetings. All those things were happening. I want to say this morning that if we get tangled up in a mentality of law, we squeeze the life out of the prophetic. Now, does that mean you don't show up to prayer meetings or you don't volunteer to work in the cafe? Absolutely not. What it does mean is that we're not justified through those things. Verse 13, Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? And so again, Obadiah is justifying his existence. I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Again, he's locked into the law. See, Obadiah, as the text says, was a devout believer. He was one of us. In our context, he was a Christian. He would be totally unrecognisable as being under the law. He could be the person sitting next to you. Don't look at that person because you'll start thinking bad things about them. In verse 19, when Elijah asked Obadiah to summons Ahab to meet him, his response was, what have I done wrong? How have I failed the law? You see, he was, in, he was living under the oppression of an oppressive lawmaker in Ahab. This was the response of someone whose justification comes by what he or she does rather than who they are before God. When believers live like this, and this affects the church, ministry suffers, and in particular, the prophetic ministry suffers. Obadiah then goes on to justify himself. I've worshipped the Lord since my youth. In other words, it's not only what I haven't done, it's what I have done as well. And I've hidden his prophets in the caves. I've done everything that I've been meant to do. Full stop, sign off. We've got to be careful, folks, that we don't get caught up in that kind of law thinking. And it will come, it's coming through the world. Remember, it came through Ahab, government. It came through Jezebel, who was controlling the government, the worldly influence. We've got to be careful that we don't come under that because it'll start to blind us. This is why the prophetic ministry is so important because it cuts through all that. It slices through it like a sharp knife, hot knife through butter. And what we have to do in that process is we have to learn to be courageous. This takes practice. You see, Elijah delivered the message in obedience and then ran. There's nothing wrong with that. The fact is he delivered the message. He understood the dangers, but he wasn't prepared to compromise on the basis of the word that he brought. It says in verse 15 of 1 Kings 18, Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. Now, I don't think he was getting any joy out of saying that. He was saying, there's a message to be delivered, and I'm the guy to deliver it. Remember, Ahab's the type for the church. And so this is the attitude that we need to have. There's a message to be delivered. It's not going to be popular. I'm not going to get top marks for the vote but I need to deliver it and then it goes on in verse 16 so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him 
and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, I love this, this reminds me of Corey Akeley every time, Is that you, troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. What an incredible declaration of the truth. Remember, this is the king he's speaking to. You have abandoned the Lord's command and followed the Baals. You see, that's what truth does. It cuts through the rubbish. To the world, the church is trouble. Our trust can't be in governments. It can't be in the experts. And it can't be in anyone else but the one who appoints them. And that's our God. Don't forget, Elijah is speaking to the king. Now, if the king came to visit you, I want you to picture this. If the king came to visit you, or the queen, however, whatever you see the picture as, I can guarantee that he doesn't come alone. He'll come with the Secret Service in an American context. He'll come with the Republican Guard. He'll come with knights. He'll come with the cavalry. But the king will not travel alone. So when he comes to visit you, it's a pretty scary thing. You see, the biggest weapon against the prophetic church is intimidation. And it will always come. It'll often come from within and within the church. But if it doesn't come from there, it will definitely come from without. When you look at Elijah, he wasn't intimidated. He was smart. He knew when to run, but he wasn't intimidated. And so the prophetic ministry, friends and family, has got to be absolutely courageous. There can be no compromise with evil. And this is why the world needs a prophetic church. In 1 Kings 18 and verse 19, and we're just following through with the text, it says, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. This is Elijah. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent the the word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. You see, again, the prophetic ministry is not hidden. It's very public. And so when we say something, we should expect it to be reverberating through society. If it's not doing that, they're not hearing us. If we're not saying something that reverberates then it's just mingling in with the rest of the world. Prophetic ministry brings the vision. It separates right from wrong, good from evil. You see, the church has an aversion towards doing that. We don't like doing that. And we're getting worse at it, actually. We're in a situation where all we want to do is please everybody. And when you try and please everybody, nobody hears the message. Unfortunately, the message of the church is one of division. And we mustn't shy away from that. You see, no one ever came to Christ without repenting. And so to bring, as I love the message that Lockie brought, and obviously he loved it this morning. He was connected to it, which was great. I love that message because it's a message of division. Unless you repent, you will not see the kingdom of God. There's nothing unifying about that. We have, there's a verdict that's been made against humanity and unless we execute that verdict, people have no chance of going to heaven. And so the prophetic ministry must bring division. Jesus carried the same prophetic burden. If you look in the New Testament, I'm not talking Old Testament here. In Matthew 10, verse 34, Jesus, this is in red letter, Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Wow. You see, the message of the prophetic church is not of this world. And the whole purpose for us being here is to bring the world to God. 
The world won't come to God on the world's terms. It must come to him on his terms. And where we fail to execute that prophetic message, there's a world going to hell. And the burden of that rests on our shoulders. Now, I don't want that to be law. Don't live under the law. But that is a fact. The church has an aversion to truth and justice. And friends, it's got to change. 1 Kings 18 verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? He's speaking to the church. This is Israel, the forerunner of the church. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. What did the people say? Nothing. It says the people said nothing. Now, I've learned over the years, preaching's an interesting gig because you, you're standing here watching faces that are, some of them are sleeping, some of them are drifting off, some of them are looking at Facebook. When people go quiet, that's a good thing. The people said nothing. You know what that tells me? They heard everything he said. They were fixed on what he was saying. You see, the fact is, we can't have two opinions. The church has got to be prophetic. We mustn't have two minds. Verses 22 through to 29, and we're not going to read them this morning, document the vain attempts of the prophets of Baal to call fire down on the sacrifice. You remember the story. It's great. It's the, the last OK corral. By this time, Elijah is having some incredible fun watching these guys trying to call down fire. And it says in verse 27 of 1 Kings 18, At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's in deep sleep or busy traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. It sounds like some of our prayer meetings, doesn't it? You see, the world has no real power to change anything. Although Ahab set about looking for grass, establishing his climate change policy, sorting out all the problems of the world, nothing really changed. It's only when the church stands up and proclaims the truth and the prophetic truth of God that things begin to change. I've heard it said that nations receive the governments that the church deserves, and I think that's true. Now, I'm not going to get political this morning. I don't start work until next Monday, so I'm not going to do it until then. But you know where I'm heading with that. Guys, we've got to engage in this process in a way that's prophetic, in a way that's divisive, in a way that brings the truth. The world needs a demonstration of the power of God. You see, Elijah then prayed, didn't he? We know the story. He prayed, and he, not only that, but he drenched the sacrifice. He quenched the spirit he poured everything he had on the sacrifice. And yet God was still true to his word. 1 Kings 18, verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You see, the world will never acknowledge Christ until we are a prophetic church and we allow God to do what he does. We don't have to rescue him. The problem with the seeker-sensitive movement is that we've set about rescuing God from the things he's said in Scripture. Have you read the Old Testament? He's a mass murderer. We've got to rescue that, that whole story. We've got to change it somehow. We cannot have a mass murderer for God. Have you seen what happens in the end? He's throwing people into the fire of hell. We've got to rescue that story. We can't let it happen. Friends, we must not mess with the message. Here at Southland, we won't do that. We will never do it. I know Gary won't do it. I know that his successor won't do it. It just won't happen. It's built into our DNA. 
That Bible is still sitting in the concrete crying out and declaring the truth. And we can't avoid that. So a prophetic church isn't concerned about its reputation. It's not concerned about how big it grows. It's not concerned about who it upsets. It's not concerned about who comes and leaves. A prophetic church is only concerned about pleasing one person. And that's why this church has been built. Elijah's reputation, even his own life, were at stake when he responded in obedience to God, and so should ours be. Every single day. Every single day. Do you know that you're a martyr? You're already a martyr. You've already died. That word in the Greek means witness. You've been called to witness the glory of God and tell the world about it. A prophetic church will always stand for truth. And the enemy's counter-argument is that we should preach the gospel and stay away from divisive issues. Avoid ACL at all costs. Don't ever have them coming to the church. Don't get creation science in, whatever you do. Because they believe forever, they believe Genesis is true. Don't do that. You see, the gospel message is a message of truth. Jesus said it this way, and I'm going to finish with this scripture. We all know it. In John 14, verse 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We cannot take the truth out of the message of Christ, and we've taken at least a third of the gospel out. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Guys, I know that you know all this stuff. We've, this is bread and butter for us. We know this stuff well. I want to encourage you in the way forward. Southland has never pulled back. We've never shied away from things that could be potentially controversial. We haven't done it for controversy's sake. We've done it because I believe God's called us as a prophetic church, to proclaim the truth of the antiquated scripture and to also declare the prophetic word of the Lord. And we must continue to do that. Again, our message, we, we often think that the prophecy time during church expresses our prophetic heart, and it does to a certain extent. But that's only practice. The true essence of the prophetic church is the message that's heard out there in the world. So we come together Sunday. This is a refuge. This is a time where we encourage one another, we build each other up, and we prepare ourselves for the next week that's ahead. You've probably heard me say that we have 6.9 days of the week to serve Jesus and to do the works of the kingdom, and we have point one of the week in church on Sunday morning where what we're going to do is worship God and practice. That's true of a prophetic church. 